to meet you. A uh, great joy to be here. Actually, a daydream coming true to speak with you and to give you some thoughts on one of the books we could publish after 10 years of work on a biography on Hermann Kallenbach, Mahatma Gandhi's friend in South Africa. Maybe first I will tell you about Gandhi speaking about Kallenbach so that you understand how close the friendship was between them. And later, after introducing to, the, to this book, we published in 1997 in the English language and in the German language, I would like to um, uh, introduce our work a bit of our Society for Education. We have started this work more than 30 years ago and it might be interesting for you to know what we are doing in the field of adult education uh, for peace and violence. Myself, I, um, I visit you now, first time here in Chennai. Uh, and I am uh, from Berlin, Germany, and my uh, research on Gandhi started during the 80s, and we first published booklets. Uh, one of these are here in English language, Tolstoy and Gandhi, in the beginning of the 90s. And then we published uh, some booklets, Correspondence of Tolstoy and Gandhi and Tarak Nadas in 1997, and uh, a book about Martin Huber and Gandhi uh, with documents in English language. So then, continuing the correspondence of Bart de Licht, the Dutch pacifist, and Gandhi on war and peace between 1928 and 1930. That was in the year 2000 and continued with essays and articles on Tolstoy and Gandhi mainly, but also creating exhibitions on nonviolence. Uh, 12, 13 of them in English language between 2008 and 2020. You can find them on our website, I can show you on our website, and you can see these exhibitions. I'm speaking in English language to you because this is the medium. So my first language is German. But um, I could uh, work on the Kallenbach biography because I met the relatives of Hermann Kallenbach, who lived in Haifa, in Israel. And that's why they invited me to their home, of course, in 1987. And then I visited them and they asked me to build up their private archive together with a couple, an old couple living in Haifa, a medical doctor. Uh, I was um, compiling all the documents in two flats together to build up the archive on Hermann Kallenbach. And then I was asked to write the first concise biography on Hermann Kallenbach. Uh, maybe you will see, we show the book again, yes. And this book was um, published online some years ago, and also you find this book, you can read this book, but the uh, print copies are, uh, um, you can say, no longer available, just have the digital copy. I would like to uh, read some passages of this book to you, so that you get some um, impression and start with Gandhi on Kallenbach. When Kallenbach died in 1945, Gandhi wrote, South Africa has lost a most generous-minded citizen and the Indians of that subcontinent a very warm friend. In Hermann Kallenbach's death, 
I have lost a very dear and near friend. He used to say to me often that when I was deserted by the whole world, I would find him to be a true friend going with me. If need be, to the ends of the earth in search of truth. And uh, Gandhi could write in a letter to his former secretary, Sandhya Schlesin, who had been introduced to Gandhi through Hermann Kallenbach from the Rosenberg family in East Prussia. After Hermann Kallenbach's death, Gandhi wrote about Kallenbach, a truly good man has left us. And uh, the fact that Hermann Kallenberg came from a small village, nowadays Lithuania, shall not betray us that Hermann Kallenberg was a German citizen. Even through his years as a successful architect in South Africa, he remained a German citizen and then he was interned during the First World War as a prisoner of war in the enemy aliens detention camp at Nokelo at the, on the Isle of Man. So that's why he could not accompany Gandhi to India. So if you see now, let me say, a movie about Gandhi, don't get yourself betrayed. Karenbach worked together with Gandhi during the South African years. Of course, he was really fulfilling a mission when he visited Gandhi twice during the 30s, in 1937 and 1939. And when he died in 1945, it was because of the after effect of malaria and this was um, one uh, tragedy because he caused this malaria during his journeys. But I don't want to shed light to you this evening on Kallenbach's uh, visits at Gandhi's place uh, in the 30s this would be another lecture. I would like to start from the beginning and shed some light on Kallenbach, who was the founder of Tolstoy Farm together with Gandhi. Both of them had a correspondence with Tolstoy. You can find in our book. Uh, and this correspondence related to Tolstoy's letter to Indian or letter to Hindu, which was published by Gandhi in South Africa. He received the permission also to name his second farm settlement after Tolstoy. And Kalenba and Gandhi corresponded with Tolstoy. And Kallenbach visited the translators of Tolstoy in uh, England and Scotland. Isabella Five and Mayu, uh, Charles Dunbar Daniels, Elna Maud. He also visited the Tolstoy colony, Berlin, and the uh, Free Age Press, with small booklets, Tolstoy's articles and pamphlets, which were very influential during this period of time about non-violence and peace, non-resistance to evil. And Gandhi and Kallenbach even supported the widow of the station owner who hosted Tolstoy during his last days when the station owner had died and the widow became poor. Such a great affection to Count Will Tolstoy the writer for peace. 
against war, in favor of non-violence. Now I would like to uh, give you an idea how intelligent Gandhi was when he described this interesting uh, different characters, different qualities which Kalanba incorporated. He said when he wrote a letter to Kalanba as an enemy alien prisoner of war, your life there must be a model for the others. This is what Gandhi wrote to Kalimba. Your life there must be a model for the others. How I would love to think that you are there vindicating your German birth, your ancestor, Jewish faith, and our joint ideals. You vindicate the first two, German Jewish, if you realize the third, Satyagraha Samadhan. And I know you will not fail. And Gandhi missed Helen Buck during his campaign in Champaran very much. He wrote affectionate letters, he documented his letters. Moments when he missed coming at his side to continue Satyagraha. Now, who was Hermann Kalimba? Born in 1871 in a um, small village. He was raised called Rus, where you find now a sculpture of Kalimba and Gandhi. I could also facilitate to, uh, to bring about by a lecture at the Vilnius Jewish Library in Lithuania uh, that was nine years ago. And one year later, the sculpture was inaugurated by the grandson, great grandson of Gandhi, Usha Gandhi. Um, the, the, son of uh, grand niece of Hermann Kallenberg, Heli Seid, who I happened to meet a few days ago again after many years in Berlin, and uh, also uh, by, um, let me say, those who try to follow the path of peace in Lithuania. So there's a sculpture of Gandhi and Kallenberg now at Kallenberg's birthplace in Rosen. Near the Russian Exclave, former cities, city names were Königsberg, Memel, nowadays Klaipeda, Kaliningrad. And this was the area, East Prussia, where Hallenbach came from, and also Sonja Schlesin from the Rosenberg family. And so you can say these were. German citizens with Russian descent from the Kalmanovich family. And of course, a family of lawyers, by the way. You find this reference in our biography, which you can read. And so, Kalmanovich's father was a Hebrew teacher, became a timber merchant, and owned a sawmill practical. So he was uh, the third eldest of seven children, and the youngest brother, son Samuel Karmanovich, the uncle of Hermann Kallenbach, was the barrister at law. You remember the barrister at law, so and he succeeded as a lawyer in a very famous case. And uh, Kallenbach was not brought up in a Jewish settle, but 
his parents observed the Jewish holidays and customs, but they were educating the one daughter, Janet, and six sons, Samuel, Herman, Jeremiah, Simon, Nathan, Max. By sending them to German schools and colleges at Memel and Tilsit. And Hermann Kallenborg liked to make all kinds of sports. He was a um, muscular man. He wanted to be strong, completely countering all the anti Semitic stereotypes of his age. So he was a muscle Jew. Going to he was not just a sportsman, but also he diligently took up his higher studies, apprenticeship and vocational training, interrupted by one year of military service. After his school in East Prussia, he received his technical skills in the western and southern parts of Germany, studied in college. Until Easter 1890, apprentice during summer 1890 to a master carpenter, Weiss in Königsberg, studied at the Technikum Strelitz, continued his apprenticeship in Königsberg and Tilsit, studied at the Royal School for Architects in Stuttgart, and in the summer of 1890. Two, he was apprenticed to a master mason, continued his studies in Stuttgart, and in 1893 and 1894, he worked as draftsman and clerk of works at the offices of architect Meisenbacher in Stuttgart. Then he served for one year with the Royal Engineers in Munich, continued his studies in Munich, passed his examinations in 1896, so he became a mason, a carpenter, a building technician, and an architect. Then he left for South Africa. That was the perspective, becoming a successful architect in South Africa. To join his uncles, Henry and Simon Secchi, in Johannesburg. And this would become the new home 25 years the land of his dreams as a building pioneer. So he liked ice skating, swimming, cycling, gymnasts, <coughs> he embodied strength, um, firmness. And he was uh, endowed with a sense of justice and he disliked any kind of discrimination which he faced in Germany, South Africa too. So, he always compared the situation, the Jewish community situation with uh, those who were discriminated. So, he was in solidarity with those who suffered from discrimination. So I can go on like this forever, but I would like to come to the essentials, uh, because you should then know how, how they met Gandhi and Kalan. Chapter 2, Friendship with Gandhi. Uh, we met by accident. He was a friend of Mr. Kant's, and as the letter had discovered deep down in him a vein of other worldliness, he introduced him to me. The vein of other worldliness. It was Gandhi's work. Something nowadays we might call spiritual, or some spiritual aspiration. Something which was going beyond his profession. So he was a friend of Mr. Khan. Mohammed and Gloria, and uh, Mr. Gandhi is the political leader of the Indians in South Africa. 
The number of Indian inhabitants is at the moment over 150,000 in Transvaal, Orange River Colony, Orange Free State, NATO, Cape Colony and Rhodesia. These people have never received an equal political standing as the rest of the European inhabitants enjoy. And they require a leader of the moral caliber of a personality as Mr. Gandhi. Mr. Gandhi is also the editor of a journal called Indian Opinion. He expresses for his people their wishes and their needs, also educational requirements. He represents them to the authorities in their most dire needs. For this purpose, he has founded a colony named Phoenix, about 14 miles from Durban, on which approximately 60 persons have made their homes, helping in agricultural aspects of country life. There is a school and a prayer room and the machinery for a printing press. The system of this colony is to educate and show them a way of life in which they can live as an example to their fellow Indians, a tremendously modest and yet a lovable way of life. I do not intend to join the community of this colony. As we know, Hadenberg then joined the Tolstoy farm actively, but not Phoenix settlement. Gandhi had founded this Phoenix settlement in Natal in December 1904. Phoenix settlement was inspired by John Ruskin, essays on the principles of political economy until this last, um, which Pollock, HSL Pollock, English, Jewish English secretary of Gandhi, uh, had recommended to God. And uh, Kallenbach later became the responsible trustee of Phoenix Settlement. And Phoenix became the model experiment for the unique Tolstoy farm. When I came to know him, I was startled at his love of luxury and extravagance. This is what Gandhi wrote about Kallenbach. But at our first meeting, he asked searching questions concerning matters of religion. We incidentally talked of Gautama Buddha's renunciation. Our acquaintance soon ripened into very close friendship. So much so that we thought alike. We thought alike. And he was convinced that he must carry out in his life the changes I was making in mind. And he was convinced that he must carry out in his life the changes I was making in mine. This is what Gandhi wrote about Karl. These changes were multifold. Gandhi influenced Kallenbach to become a vegetarian. They often changed their diet. Quote, cooking was practically done away with raw groundnuts, bananas, dates, lemons and olive oil composed our usual diet. They reduced their expenses and deprivileged themselves. Quote, our ambition was to live the life of the poorest people. Non-stimulating foods were used in their saltless diet and regular weekly fasting served to control the palate and to reduce the passions. By spiritual discipline, they wanted to root out the carnal desires of mind and body and the greed for luxuries. Kallenbach revolutionized his life by reducing his monthly expenses from 75 to 8 pounds sterling. 75 to 8 pounds sterling. Well, it was a fairly hard life that we led. Gandhi retrospectively remembered the reformed life. He is a man of strong feelings, wide sympathies and childlike simplicity. He is an architect by profession. But there is no work, however lowly, which he would consider to be beneath his dignity. When I broke up my Johannesburg establishment, I lived with him, but he would be hurt if I offered to pay him my share of the household expenses. 
and would plead that I was con responsible that I was responsible for considerable savings in his domestic economy. This was indeed true. So voluntary simplicity became the constitution of the life in self-reliance in the Kral, Ron Davids, District Orchards in Johannesburg, and at the Mountain View, Linksfield, Johannesburg, and later on during the settlement life, on Tolstoy Farm. Kallenbach wrote to his brother Simon in Germany, For the last five weeks we have no native servant, and therefore we are attending ourselves to all our work. We cook, bake, scrub, and clean the house and the yard. We polish our own shoes and work in the flower and vegetable garden. We are leading a most unusual life which helps the person to develop more independently and the person becomes better. Mr. Gandhi is a vegetarian according to his religious conviction as a Hindu. For the last two years I have given up meat eating. For the last year I also did not touch fish anymore. And for the last 18 months I have given up my sex life. I believe that I have gained in character, strength, mental vitality, and physical development. My bodily well-being has become better and bigger. I have never been eccentric, and I believe I am not so now. I have changed my life, my daily life, in order to simplify it. And I found out that in every direction this change has helped me. And I hope that I shall be able to continue my life accordingly. Notwithstanding, I shall change my life even tomorrow, should I feel that this way of living should not suit me. So they addressed each other lower house, Kalenba, and upper house, Gan. Kallenbach was the lower house and Ganjiji the upper house. The lower house preparing the budget and the upper house vetoing, vetoing large chunks of it. In the English parliament there is a senate. In the English parliament there is a senate, upper house, and the executive lower house or the lawgiver and the one who carries out the laws. In 1908, Kallenbach bought a car to surprise Gandhi and fetch him home from prison in Johannesburg. But Kallenbach was surprised to find Gandhi completely silent on their way home. For Gandhi, the car was an unnecessary expense. For one year, the car stood in the garage, unused, and Kallenbach sold it. During a voyage in 1914, Gandhi threw two pairs of Kallenbach's binoculars into the sea. The second pair was a precious gift to Kallenbach from his uncle Seki. All unnecessary luxuries were disposed of by Gandhi into the rubbish heap. For instance, silver rings for serviettes, because superfluous luxuries would cause distress. on the morning on which he had to go to meet General Smuts at Pretoria for a very important interview. I found him berating me severely for something or other that had happened in our domestic affairs, something perhaps that I had omitted to do. I remonstrated with him saying it was no use his wasting his time over domestic trifles when he must be thinking of the interview he was going to have with General Smuts. No, he flared up and said, these little things are to me of as much importance as the big ones. For they touch the very core of our life, and truth is one whole. It has no compartments. And thus I have seen him on small as well as big occasions pursuing the same passionate search of truth. I have had the privilege of sharing his joys and his sorrows too. 
a defeat in the campaign means not so much to him as the lapse of a dear one from truth or purity. And I was witness once to one such event coming to him with a staggering blow. But I saw the reason of his distress over these incidents. He lavished his affection on me and therefore dealt with me more severely than he would have done with others. That was the tyranny of his affection. But that affection is my proudest possession. Now, chapter three. Not, not many more chapters, just <laughs> two more. Huh? So, chapter three. A staunch Tolstoyan. Maybe we can show this uh, last photo. The last photo you see is from uh, Indian opinion. A staunch Tolstoyan. Uh, yeah, see? Mr. Kallenbach walking from Tolstoy Farm to Johannesburg. Yeah, a staunch Tolstoy uh, supplement to in your opinion. 1912. Read Tolstoy and tell me what you think of his teachings. What Tolstoy wants and what I too am striving for is to recognize the right and to live accordingly without disturbing my fellow beings as far as possible. To give one's opinion, give advice, to become a world reformer might be the ideal of many, but it is not Tolstoy's. He says, live according to the right once you have recognized it. Each one according to his capacity to realize it. Never disturb your fellow beings. Carry out and practice that which you considered right in theory. Frederick the Great was to have said, each one should seek salvation according to his own fashion. Accordingly, everyone will execute the right as far as his understanding, his courage, his energy, and his circumstances allow him. To realize the right of theory, this is what Tolstoy wants to teach us, and not only from his books, but from his new way of life. Hermann wrote these lines to his brother Simon when he was living on Tolstoy farm. A communal settlement, as we know, for the Indian families, the husbands in prison as Satyagrahi, Mr. Kallenbach has given the name Tolstoy Farm to the farm which he has offered for the use of the Satyagrahi families. He has great faith in Count Tolstoy's teaching and tries to live up to it. He himself wants to live on the farm and follow a simple mode of life. It appears Mr. Kallenbach will gradually give up his work as architect and live in complete poverty. Mr. Kallenbach has rendered a valuable service by offering the use of his farm, but more so by deciding to live among our people. He has also agreed to look after the women folk in the absence of Mr. God. That any white should be moved by such a spirit must be attributed to the power of Satyagraha. Mm. Kallenbach and Gandhi exchanged letters with Tolstoy, asking for permission to continue their communitarian experiment in his name, Tolstoy Farm. Tolstoy morally supported his brothers and sisters in the Transvaal. He had learned from the first biography on Gandhi by Joseph Doak how the non-violent campaigns of Upper House and Lower House agreed with his principle of non violent non-cooperation with injustice. At this time, at that time, all over the world settlers were inspired by Tolstoy. Many examples for this. Now referring to Tolstoy farm. The farm measures about 1,100 acres. Being two miles in length and three quarters of a mile in breadth, it is situated near Lawley Station, 
22 miles from Johannesburg. It takes 20 minutes to walk down from the station to the farm. By rail, it generally takes about one and a half hours to reach it from there. The soil appears to be fertile. The farm has about thousand, thousand fruit-bearing trees growing on it. There are peaches, apricots, figs, almonds, walnuts, etc. In addition, there are eucalyptus and wattle trees. The farm has two wells and a small spring. The landscape is beautiful. At the head there is a hill with some more or less level land at the foot. This is a very important venture. Its roots go deep. It is up to the Satyagrahis who settle there to make it bear sweet fruit by the way they live. So that was on May 30, 1910, when Kallenbach had offered his farm and the use of the buildings to the Indian families free of any rent of charge, as long as the struggle with the Transvaal government lasts. And since June 4, 1910, Kallenbach, Gandhi and two of his sons settled on Tolstoy Farm. The vegetarian Kallenbach he liberated himself from tobacco and alcohol, intoxicants, wholeheartedly dedicated his service to his Indian friends with whom he shared their life on the farm. What will perhaps appeal most of all to the Indian community is the way in which Mr. Kallenbach literally as well as figuratively takes off his coat to the work of helping the cause he has made his own. We are having a very busy time with our farm work. The pruning of the fruit trees, the cultivating the soil and manuring of a large vegetable garden and planting of new fruit trees. I have had erected a new windmill which is pumping about 900 gallons of water per hour into the reservoir, 130 feet high. From the reservoir I have laid pipes to three different buildings and also to the vegetable garden. The day could have double as many hours and I would still be as busy as ever. In Potchef's form, Kallenbach had studied governmental model gardens and his experience was the basis for the agricultural planting. For there were no servants on the farm and all the work from cooking down to scavenging was done by the inmates. There were many fruit trees to be looked after and enough gardening to be done as well. Mr. Kallenbach was fond of gardening and had gained some experience of this work in one of the governmental model gardens. It was obligatory on all young and old who were not engaged in the kitchen to give some time to gardening. The children had the lion's share of this work which included digging pits, felling timber and lifting loads. This gave them ample exercise. They took delight in the work and so they did not generally need any other exercise or games. Kallenbach learned sandal making from the German Trappist monks in Marion Hill Monastery. After completing his course, he taught this art to Gandhi and others at Tolstoy Farm. Carpentry, planting of fruit trees, gardening, open air work, learning by doing, contributed contributed greatly to the health of all the inmates. They reduced their expenses in order to be able to continue the Satyagraha campaign. Voluntary simplicity, village life, basic education through vocational training, craftsmanship and agricultural work, ethics of renunciation, vegetarianism, chastity, non-violent resistance and non-cooperation with the evil. These were the principles which Leopold Stoll had advocated. Also, we place a very high value on Mr. Kallenbach's offer of his farm for the benefit of Satyagrahis. If the families of the latter use it well, we shall have no occasion for anxiety, however long the struggle lasts. There will be much saving and expenditure, and those who settle on the farm will learn to be happy. They will have on the farm a noble life in place of the unclean and monotonous way of town life. Moreover, what they will learn on the farm 
will prove useful for a lifetime. Indeed, we have said in the past that the Indian community would be well rewarded if it were to take to agriculture and would be saved the anxieties incidental to business. We have to pay a heavy price for not, for not recognizing the value of this best of occupations. Agricultural life, so the good life according to John Ruskin. Um, Actually, this is what Gandhi learned from John Ruskin. Now, uh, this um, was a model for the later ashrams in India, also, uh, for Stolfa. Uh, Mr. Kalmbach has given all he legitimately could and has expected no return. He does not want to develop his estate through the labor of those passive resistors who could put in their labor without paying them for it. Acts such as Mr. Kalendorf's are calculated to bring East and West nearer in real fellowship than any amount of rhetorical writing or speaking. We shall watch this experiment with very great interest. And then would uh, be chapter 4, the epic march. And I would like to know, this was this cross-border march of so many uh, risking their lives. You know, the epic march started on November 6, 1913, when 2,037 men, 137 women and 57 children offered prayers and commenced the pilgrimage in the name of God, cross the border between Natal and the Transvaal, between Charleston and Fortress. And two days before, Europeans met in Fortress to publicly threaten the Indians with violent shooting. So what I will tell you now is not the huge organizational work Kallenberg and his fellow secretary, the fellow secretaries of Gandhi, um, undertook to um, bring this march to its success. Um, not only them, as you know, also Tanginai in the Tanginian community. Uh, without this uh, support, without these uh, activities, the epic march would have succeeded. But in this, in this um, meeting in Fox Rust, everything was decided. Would there be a massacre? Or would there be bloodshed, or would it, would it go successfully? It was Hermann Kallenbach who converted their minds. So Europeans met, so also Hermann Kallenbach could meet. So he joined the meeting. Mr. Kallenbach attended this meeting to reason with the Europeans, who were, however, not prepared to listen to him. Indeed, some of them even stood up to assault him. Mr. Kallenbach is an athlete, having received physical training at the hands of Sandro, and it was not easy to frighten him. One European challenged him to, to a duel. Mr. Kallenbach replied, As I have accepted the religion of peace, I may not accept the challenge. Let him who will come and do his worst with me. But I will continue to claim a hearing at this meeting. You have publicly invited all Europeans to attend. And I am here to inform you that not all Europeans are ready as you are to lay violent hands upon innocent men. There is one European who would like to inform you that the charges you level at the Indians are farce. The Indians do not want what you imagine them to do. They do not wish... Oh. The Indians do not want what you imagine them to do. The Indians are not out to challenge your position as rulers. They do not wish to fight with you or to fill the country. They only seek justice, pure and simple. They propose to enter the Transvaal, not with a view to settling there, 
but only as an effective demonstration against the unjust tax which is levied on them. They are brave men. They will not injure you in person or in property. They will not fight with you, but enter the Transvaal they will, even, even in the face of your gunfire. They are not the men to beat a retreat from fear of your bullets or your spears. They propose to melt, and I know they will melt your hearts by self-suffering. This is all I have to say. I have had my say, and I believe that I have thus rendered you a service. Beware and save yourselves from perpetrating a wrong. With these words, Mr. Kallenbach resumed his seat. The audience was rather abashed. The pugilist who had invited Mr. Kallenbach to single combat became his friend. So now maybe to end my talk, I just want to give the last words Kallenbach shared uh, with his friends at the farewell banquet, which was given in the Masonic Hall Johannesburg in honor of Gandhi, Kastorba and Kallenbach on July 14, 1914. They were presented addresses of the British Indian Association, the Chinese Association, the Tamil Benefit Society, the Transvaal Indian Women's Association, and the Gujarati, the Mohammedan, and the Parsi communities. At the farewell meeting in the town hall of Durban, Gandhi thanked the community on behalf of Kalimba, who was another brother to him, for the addresses presented. The community had done well in recognizing Mr. Kallenbach's worth. Mr. Kallenbach would tell them that he came to the struggle to gain. He considered that by taking up their cause, he gained a great deal in the truest sense. Mr. Kallenbach had done splendid work during the strike at Newcastle. And when the time came, he cheerfully went to prison, again thinking that he was the gainer and not the loser. So there were, um, you can say, receptions after their arrival in Cape Town and representatives of Indian communities from Port Elizabeth to Madras places expressed their gratitude. With reference to the cooperation with his dear friend and guide, Mr. Gandhi, Herman Kallenbach summarized in his farewell speech what the years of Satyagraha meant to him and what these profound experiences should teach to the South African Indians. Kalanbos said, You have made me understand better my own religion. You have made me love more my own people. You have helped me to be less arrogant, less slothful, and you have made me become more truthful. And then he gave his advice before saying goodbye, farewell. If I may place before you my humble views, I may say the first and foremost condition is that the two principal sections of the Indian community in South Africa, Muslims and Hindus, must live in peace, and that those members of the two communities who take up this peace work in thought and in action in real earnest are performing the greatest service to their community here and to their motherland. Second, not only retain outwardly, but profess and practice also inwardly under the new conditions of life created in South Africa, your religions, Muslims to be true and become truer Muslims, and Hindus to be true and become truer Hindus. The third, not to be ashamed, but on the contrary, to be proud of these Indian customs and habits, which your acknowledged true men have practiced for thousands of years and which true men are practicing now and hold so sacred. 
If these three conditions are still after and made progress in, you do not require Gandhi's here. As every one of you will be a Gandhi to a certain extent. And no oppression often through selfish interests produced by and even forced upon the communities to live with by modern civilization can never assail.